every episode. Carter. <laughs> right when we start recording, Carter always has to cough or sneeze. Okay. Um, fart? No, I don't fart. Okay. Ever? <laughs> th- this series involves people with PhD. <laughs> this is <He's> farting. <laughs> educational program. Sorry. None of us no. even introduce ourselves. <laughs> Hello and welcome to our professor podcast. I'm Micah Sander. I'm Cody Green. And in today's episode, we spoke with Professor Rawson. Professor Michael Rawson is a historian of environmental, urban, and cultural history and is particularly interested in how ideas about nature have shaped environmental change. He studied with William Cronin while earning his PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before coming to Brooklyn College in 2007, he taught at the University of Wisconsin and Stanford University. Rawson is the author of Eden on the Charles, The Making of Boston, which was a finalist for the 2011 Pulitzer Prize for History, and The Nature of Tomorrow, A History of the Environmental Future. He is also a member of the faculty at the CUNY Graduate Center, and he's currently working on a large-scale narrative history of Boston. Coming to you from Istanbul, not uh, Constantinople, not Constantinople. <laughs> we have with us Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for being here on our first podcast. <laughs> Rebecca? Can you tell us a bit about what it's like having a class with Professor Rawson? So I've taken two courses with Professor Rawson. The first one was over Zoom. That was History of the Future. And the second course I took was in the fall semester of 2022. And that course was the Historian's Craft course that all history majors are required to take. And yeah, that was also an amazing class. I will say that Professor Rawson's course is extremely engaging, both of them. I also will say they're both extremely organized, and they're always very tailored to students' interests, which I find to be really wonderful. History of the Future is a little bit more of like a fun course. The fun thing about that course is that there's a lot of visual aids. We get to watch movies. We are looking at all sorts of futuristic posters. We're learning about all these weird and wacky books that people wrote about what the future might look like. I wouldn't say that history uh, 2001 is drier. It's just different, I would say, while the class is called Historian's Craft, and that's kind of like what you're learning. Throughout the course, you go through all different methods of historical writing and kind of look at all these different examples of where historians use those methods. It's really an important piece of the puzzle for any history major, anybody interested in learning about the process of historical writing. Professor Rosen taught it extremely well. There was lots of readings. They were all interesting. (laughs) I tried to do all of them. Um, I mostly succeeded. And they were always like really relevant to like, you know, exactly what we were talking about in class. The discussions were always super engaging. I love talking about them with my peers. What is the typical workload like? How many assignments do you get? Is it intense? How does that help you understand the material and everything? The workload, it's not like, you know, it's not a lot. And what makes it like not feel like a lot is that everything that you're doing really is purposeful. It's a really well-structured course. So you really like understand exactly why you're doing and why you're reading all the things that you're reading. And it's never, it's never anything that's going to take up too much time. It's a reasonable amount of work. You know exactly what you have to do and when on the first day of class. So there's no surprises with Professor Ross and everything's like well planned out. And as long as you follow the schedule, you know, you'll be completely fine. You stay on top of the work, you know. So you did an independent study with Professor Ross, and what was the topic of your study, and what was it like working with him so personally? So uh, the topic of my study was from a, a part of history that I hadn't had a lot of experience studying. So Professor Rawson is doing a very comprehensive, very large project on the history of Boston, so my project with Professor Rawson was to help him out to the degree that I was able to with a very, very small piece of that project. And so the dates that I was looking at specifically were uh, 1776 until uh, around 1810. Working with Professor Rawson was wonderful. It was also through the Tao Foundation. So we were required to have weekly meetings, which we, for the most part, we did. Every time we met, Professor Rawson was always able to give me like great guidance about like what direction I needed to be headed in, what was good about the work that I was doing so far, 
And although I was supposed to be his research assistant, I can just say that I definitely benefited far more from working with him than he benefited, than I contributed <laughs> to this project. I really doubt that. <laughs> but sure it, was. it was really, really kind of him to take me on as an independent student. And I was so not confident. Like, it was honestly, he came to me. I wasn't thinking about applying for the Tau project, but I had written a paper for Historian's Craft that was, you know, okay. And he liked it and he thought that I would be a good fit for this project. And yeah, it was really wonderful. I think it's time for the uh, main interview. Yes, I, I I should say before we go to the main interview, because we are in Istanbul on Professor Fishman's study abroad trip, it was difficult to schedule our final interview with Professor Sengupta, but that episode is coming. All the Sengupta heads don't worry because the interview will drop within the next few weeks. So just wanted to make sure you all are aware of that. But let's get right to it. Everybody, please welcome Professor Michael Rawson. All right, Professor Rawson, thank you so much for joining us today. Our first question for you is, why did you choose this area of study? Did it change at all or develop? And was there any particularly important professor or mentor at any stage of your education? Okay, which area of study are, are we referring to? I've, I've done a bunch of different things. Whichever one you would prefer to describe yourself with, whichever one you want to wear as a badge of honor. <laughs> Um, well, my, my most recent book, uh, as you know, was The Nature of Tomorrow, A History of the Environmental Future. And I, I think the real genesis of that project was probably not only my interest in the environment and environmental history, but also a longtime interest in science fiction. But it, it did not start out as a project about the environmental future. It actually started out as a project about ecotopias. And ecotopias are utopias that are either fictional or non-fictional that, that focus on establishing a balance with the natural world. And what I found as I got into the research is that there are not a lot of those out there. They have been written, they, they go back a long way, but they're sort of a minor theme. So to answer the kinds of questions I was asking, I needed to sort of expand my framework and started thinking more broadly, not just about visions of an environmentally friendly future, but visions of all kinds of environmental interactions in the future. And so I ended up with a with this sort of broader framework and, and the topic that I ended up with. And I think you asked about mentors as well. I've been blessed with a lot of a lot of great history teachers over the years. My high school history teacher, Joseph Valeriani, was a nut for local history. <clears throat> and he had us do this great project. I did not think it was great at the time. It took an enormous amount of work. But he had us write histories, deeply researched histories of the houses we lived in. And we had to go back as far as the records would take us, which really for, for everyone was back. I grew up in Boston, so it's back to 1630, back to the first settlers and back and, and even farther to the Native Americans before that. So we spent an enormous amount of time in the Registry of Deeds tracing land records back to see you know, who owned our house uh, before us, what, uh, what was there before the house was, and so on. And I think what I learned from that was that you can tell really large and important stories through very small places. In a sense, we were almost doing micro history before there was a micro history. In college, I worked with a professor named George Markopoulos, who was a, a Europeanist. He was a wonderful storyteller. That's what I got from him. And in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, I studied with uh, wonderful professors, uh, Paul Boyer, cultural historian, Stanley Schultz, urban historian. But I think my dissertation advisor, William Cronin, probably had the strongest influence on me. He's a wonderful scholar, a generous teacher. Uh, and I think most of what I learned about doing history and teaching history, I learned from him. You mentioned your your latest book, but I want to start with another book of yours, also concerning environmentalism, though, and our relationship with the environment. Your book, Eden on the Charles, The Making of Boston, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History and provides an environmental perspective on the creation of one of the U.S.'s first cities. The book focuses on Boston, of course, but demonstrates the country's broader relationship to the natural world as urbanization took hold 
how did Boston's construction and design influence other American urban spaces in the environment? And secondly, who was directing these visions of what Boston should be? Yeah, so there's there's been a lot written about urbanization in the 19th century, which in the Western world was the great age of city building. The book took a more environmental approach to the topic than we were seeing at the time. Urban environmental history was very much in its infancy. It's it's a new subfield, a very rapidly growing one, but there, there was a limited literature on it at the time. What I tried to do was to reimagine city building as a process of inventing new relationships to the natural world. So the concept of invention is important to the book. Boston urbanized earlier than most other American communities. So at many points, it led the nation in creating or inventing some of the first public parks, first water systems, sewer systems, suburbs, and so on. Now, today we take those urban features largely for granted, but when they were first introduced, they really represented new ways of interacting with the natural world. And their forms and the meanings they had to people were heavily contested at the time as they were being developed. Uh, at the center of the book is the role that ideas of nature have played in constructing cities. And that might seem paradoxical because cities are often thought of as among the most unnatural of places. But that approach really reflects a question that has informed and animated a lot of my work. Uh, and the question is, how have ideas about nature informed the past? Uh, and ideas about, well, ideas generally, I think, are central to how we interact with the environment. There's a, certainly a physical environment out there. But there's also a cultural one in our heads that we should not ignore. So, for example, when we encounter uh, a landscape of meadows and trees, what do we see? Do we see a park that's meant for leisure? Do we see a pasture where we can graze some cattle? Do we see a great place for condos? And how we answer that question is very much conditioned by culture. Now, the same was true in 19th century Boston. I argue in the book that ideas about nature shaped these new kinds of places and that those ideas emerged from a social context and from the goals of particular social groups. So for example, the upper classes in Boston wanted to remove the cows from Boston Common. And they wanted to do that because the cows were interfering with a newly developing pastoral aesthetic. It was an aesthetic that admired landscapes as leisure spaces rather than working spaces. So they wanted to separate the, the, the working, the cows, the, the labor end of things out from the leisure end. And that created sort of a cow problem in town where people had been recreating on the common right next to the cows for 200 years and nobody ever seemed to mind. But now ideas were changing, so the space started to change. The working classes wanted the city's new water system, 20-year debate about the water system, whether it should be a public water system or a private water system. They wanted the water free of charge because they thought of water as a right rather than a privilege. And that shaped the debate, and the city ends up with a public water system rather than a private one because of it. So social goals influenced ideas of nature, which in turn shaped environmental change. So was this then sort of an early attempt at an ecotopia? Despite the title of the book, no, it, it was <laughs> not. I think the book title can give that impression more than anything else, even on the Charles. But I actually did not name the book. That's that's uh, something a lot a lot of people don't know is that authors often don't name their books. Publishers retain the right, and that's because it's probably for the best. They they know the audience. They 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 have the marketing staff. They know what sells. I honestly could not come up with. I, I won't say I had a better title. I didn't. Uh, I could not come up with a good title for the book. It was very very academic and bland in general. Eden on the Charles. A lot of people like that title. I have mixed feelings about it because I don't feel it accurately reflects what's in the book but it is catchy. <laughs> There's a debate that, at least for me, was brought up in the historian's craft, and I know a lot of history classes will mention it, whether or not historians should leak their work to the present or appreciate history and let it stay in the past. But with global warming set to cross one and a half degrees Celsius in coming years, and the environmental destruction of our ecosystem is it's guaranteed at this point. What are discussions like in the community of environmental historians? And do you feel a need to link your work to climate change or is that for other disciplines? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think all history has to be presentist history. I think there's plenty of value in studying the past for its own sake. But environmental history does tend to lend itself to a presentist approach. 
in one way, it's kind of in the DNA of the field. Environmental history emerged in the 1970s along with environmentalism, and it was deeply influenced by environmentalism. So it's always had an activist bent. But as you say, we're also in the midst of an ongoing environmental crisis. So environmental historians are talking about ways that we can help people to understand how we got where we are now and how we might chart a path forward. To my mind, historical context is essential to understanding what's going on around us today with with the environmental crisis. People need to know, for example, that climate has changed in the past and that it has directly impacted human societies when it's done that. They need to know that the oil industry knew fossil fuels would cause climate change back in the 1960s. People need to know that what we call progress, which is a concept with deep historical roots, that it has not only helped to cause current problems, but it's standing in the way of solving environmental problems as well. So I think environmental historians can do quite a bit to help us understand how past societies have dealt with environmental challenges. And they can help point us toward realistic options for the future as well. So it's not it's not essential that all environmental histories do that, but I think there are often opportunities there and environmental historians are taking as many of them as they can find. Do you have a single approach to teaching every one of your classes or does it vary? Pretty much what can a student expect coming into one of your classes? A lot depends on the kind of class, but in my classes, students can generally expect to do a lot of reading, a lot of writing, and a lot of talking about what they're encountering and and what they're experiencing. I don't see history as a passive activity. I think people tend to think that history is about absorbing facts, and it kind of is that in high school in many ways, which is too bad. And that leads to the, the impression that the person who knows the most facts is the best historian. That's what history is all about. But you guys know that that's entirely incorrect. History is a way of seeing and thinking. It's a set of skills that we use to help us understand the world around us. To look at things historically is to look at them in a very particular and I think a particularly revealing way. So I try to teach those skills by assigning engaging stuff to read, engaging stuff to watch. A lot of that comes in the form of primary sources and often fiction as well, from often from the period that we're studying, because that immerses students in the past. I think of primary sources almost as time machines. Why read an article on Puritan sermons when you can just read a Puritan sermon? And that's going to just transport you into the past. And we can talk about what's going on in that sermon and unpack it so that it's more understandable in a modern context. But every primary source is a little time machine. And I like to take students on those rides into the past. Another example would be when I teach American attitudes toward the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I don't assign an academic article for that. I have students watch the training scene from Rocky IV. You must know that everybody knows that scene. It's seven minutes long. It's inherently entertaining, so it keeps your attention, right? But learning to decode it gets you inside the heads of the Americans who were watching it in theaters back in 1985. It it contains an enormous amount of information about how Americans were thinking back in the 1980s during the Reagan years and the Cold War about the differences between American society and Soviet society. So for, for me, using engaging material in the classroom or, or assigning it to students outside of the classroom uh, is is absolutely key to my teaching style. I'm uh, I'm very familiar with, with those scenes and with that movie. And I remember I was surprised when uh, Professor O'Keefe told me that she has not seen Rocky IV or Red Dawn. And I said, just from a historian's perspective, as a primary source, you should watch these things just to, <laughs> to see the attitudes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But to get to your most recent book, The Nature of Tomorrow, A History of the Environmental Future, For that book, you read through hundreds of stories and predictions produced across several centuries by scientists, fiction writers, government officials, and many others to give the world, quote, a better understanding of how the stories people have told themselves about the future and continue to tell themselves today have helped to shape and sustain an expectation of limitless growth. What role did these expectations play in building the modern world? And has this dream of a boundless future given way to a severely limited shape of things to come? Our expectations as individuals and as societies have played an enormous role in history and a really understudied one. Michael, you'll be familiar with the Carl Sagan quote that I use. He once said that our our dreams are maps. And I think that's a great metaphor. Sagan was essentially saying that any attempt, any attempt to picture the future actually carries causative weight because it influences our actions and our expectations. And that's true whether we're talking about formal stuff like economic forecasts or political predictions, 
or even a cartoon like the Jetsons. And we all have an appreciation for how important predictions uh, are to governments, to businesses, to institutions. You know, sometimes they're marketing and pursuing their preferred visions of tomorrow. Sometimes they're reacting uh, to forecasts made by others, but they always take it very seriously. And of course, anyone who pays attention to professional sports or political elections, they have a sense for how predictions can affect the outcomes of those kinds of events. So what I do in the book is to trace the evolution of imagined futures in the Western world, all the way from the scientific revolution to present. And one particular expectation kept appearing in source after source, the, all the, the kinds of sources that you mentioned. And it was the expectation that humankind will expand endlessly, no matter the environmental consequences. It's an expectation, a paradoxical one, of unlimited growth on a finite planet. And over time, that expectation has inspired two distinct and opposite visions of the environmental future that have become widely embraced around the world. So they'll feel very familiar. The, the first is a story that foresees complete development of the natural world. This is a future where people live in giant cities. They're often domed or they're built underground. They cultivate the oceans intensively. They drive unprofitable plants and animals to extinction, or maybe they, they reduce them to seeds and freeze them someplace in case they need the genetic material later. They control the climate uh, however they like. Ultimately, they expand into outer space. So this is a vision of no limits. It's a vision of endless frontiers. And, and there are utopian and dystopian forms of that story. The second story accepts the idea of limits and tells us that human expansion is ultimately gonna lead to environmental disaster. And this today, I think, is an even more familiar vision. It contains uh, overpopulation, water shortages, empty oceans, rising seas, depleted resources, uh, a warming climate, and ultimately you end up with disease and war and famine and societal breakdown. Now, that is a fundamentally different answer, right, to the question of what endless human growth and expansion is going to look like. But again, what these two stories have in common is that they both assume humans will pursue unlimited growth. We have a lot of trouble thinking outside that box, and that, I would argue, is a problem. I think it keeps us from developing popular visions of what a truly sustainable society might look like. Most people, I would wager, can't even imagine a future without economic growth and population growth and urban growth and so on. They can't see beyond the growth paradigm, uh, and that limits our ability to imagine a truly sustainable future. And I would argue that if we can't even imagine a sustainable future, we're that much more unlikely to achieve it. Having written Nature of Tomorrow and having taught your history of the future class, do you think that historians have a role to play in forecasting the future? I do, uh, absolutely. The historian E.H. Carr once said that historians have the future in their bones. And I couldn't agree more with that. Historians, often historians don't realize this, but they are always thinking about the future when they think about the past because the two are simply different ends of the same timeline. They tell different parts of the same story. And you know, no one writes the beginning of a story without some concept of the ending. That's actually how modern futurologists go about making their projections. They write what are called scenarios. And scenarios take the form of an analysis of the past, an assessment of the present, and then a series of projections about possible futures. I would argue that historians essentially do the same thing, although our emphasis is obviously far more on the part that explains the past than the part that forecasts the future. So historians and futurologists are often using the same set of skills. So I, I think historians would make great futurologists. And any science fiction writer will tell you that a study of history is central to their visions of the future. This is very important to science fiction writers. Isaac Asimov, for example, conceived the idea for his famous foundation series, after he read Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. That's what gave him uh, not only the inspiration, but the sort of framework for what was going to happen. Do you have any current work that you're looking forward to? Any new classes on the horizon? Ongoing research that you're excited about? Yeah, uh, right now I'm working on a large-scale history of Boston. <clears throat> it's a, a very different kind of history from what I'm used to doing for two reasons. First, it's a synthesis. So I'm drawing from secondary sources as much as from primary sources. That's a very, very uh, different way of doing history. It's actually probably more familiar to undergraduates than it is to professional historians who are constantly in the primary sources. And second, to make the book more accessible, to make it appeal to a wider audience, 
there's a greater focus on individual people than there is on ideas and social groups, which is what I previously focused on in my work. People like to read about people. So in, in a way, the book is shaping up as a series of micro histories that will hopefully by the end add up to something larger by the time I'm done. And, and just the, the, the size of the project is daunting as well. It's, it's one thing to write a book that's 250 pages. It's another to write a book that's 700. It's such a big topic that the history of an entire city over 400 years, and it's so large, uh, and the time frame for completing it is so short that I'm not working on much else right now when it, when it comes to uh, scholarship. That's really my main focus. As for new classes, I have several in mind that I just haven't had the time to get up and running. I'd like to teach sort of general course on urban history. I don't know if it would be global urban history or U.S. urban history. I haven't, haven't thought that through yet, but either one would be fun. I'd also like to teach a course that I've been thinking about for a long time on environment and technology. That will be related in some ways to my history of the future course, but it would also be, be quite different as well. And I have this sort of strange idea for a course. Maybe it's a colloquium. I don't know. It's a companion to my course on the history of the future. Rather than looking at past visions of the future, as we do in the history of the future course, this course would ask students to make history-based predictions. So they would take what we know about historical causation, maybe the historical literature on why civil wars tend to happen, and then apply that to some future predicted event. So what's, what's the probability of there being a civil war in Egypt based on what we know about not just Egyptian history, but the history of, of those events in general? But I don't, I don't know, I don't know if we'll ever see that course. But it, it's, it's, it's one that keeps coming back to mind for me. I will pay you to take that course privately with you. I just hop <laughs> online and do that course and do the readings. That sounds so cool. Yeah, yeah it would, it would be fun. It would be fun. <laughs> um, we are down to the last and most fun section. It's a series of five questions, and a very <laughs> no thinky first answer you can give us. Are you ready, Professor? I am ready. Give it to me. All right. First off, what is your favorite book? I, I don't even have to hesitate. It's uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Now, I, yes. I hope I, <laughs> you like that one good. <laughs> now, I, I mean, that, that could be one book, three books, or six books, depending on, on your perspective, I, I suppose. But it contains a deep sense, as, as you, you seem to know, Carter, a deep sense for how the past informs the present. It has a strong environmental ethic in it. And I think it's probably influenced my career in ways that I'm not even aware of. It's just, you, you cannot do better than that book. Nobody has said the correct answer yet for that answer. <laughs> that, that, is, that is the correct answer. You win. Uh, uh, favorite food? If you can consider chocolate a food, I think, I think that would be it. Your favorite non-work activity? There's a lot to choose from. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of English mysteries. I might choose that. That goes back to my childhood when I got hooked on Sherlock Holmes. But I, I, I don't know. I, I also play chess. I do Tai Chi. I have a very deep love for uh, B-level science fiction movies from the 1950s. That's fun, too. So I guess I'd throw them all in there. What's your favorite thing to do in New York City? Well, that would have to be hang out at Brooklyn College. The final and most contentious, controversial question. Uh, <laughs> your wait. favorite music genre? Oh, that's... That's a really tricky one. I'm not sure I can choose one because my musical upbringing was very eclectic. I grew up in a, a multi-generational home with my Irish father listening to the Clancy Brothers, my Italian grandparents listening to Dean Martin. My mother was listening to Ravi Shankar, the, the Indian composer. My older brother was listening to disco. My younger brother was heavily into Kiss. My sister was listening to the Partridge family. I was listening to all of it. So. My playlists today literally contain everything, everything from Mozart to Meatloaf. Um, so I, to, to, to pick a single genre, it is, it's just not possible for me. That'll be the, your biography in the future, from Mozart to Meatloaf to Michael Ross and Story. So. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> the publishers won't be able to change that title. We're, that's in the contract. It's, 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 it's in the contract. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put it in the contract. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, Professor Austin, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been a great interview. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thanks uh, for having me. Your answers are so great. And I wish I could ask you a hundred more questions, but 
Professor Napoli told us to keep this under 45 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Our Professor Podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and faculty for their contributions.